Okay, where am I? Here we go. Right, so it's this presentation, the simple multiforming one. So this is the first introduction to multiforming. Um, why we want to do it, why, do, why we need to do it, and how we have to do it. So you've got the slides, so follow along the slides um, with, the, with the presentation. Um, just in case you can't see all of this. So we'll look at the multiforming. So the big question, of course, is why should any network multiform? Um, and actually, multiforming is a very important part of being an internet service provider, being a network operator. <coughs> because if you've got one connection to the internet, it means that your network is dependent on lots of things. You're dependent on your local router, you're dependent on the WAN media, so connecting your router to your upstream provider. And you're dependent on your upstream provider as well. So you've got these three issues, all of which can have problems. So for example, if we look at the router, what could go wrong with the local router? Well, the, you can at least have the configuration going wrong. Somebody may break it. You know, we've had plenty of practice breaking configurations here in the labs. But in real life, if the configuration breaks, then you have a connectivity issue, your customers complain and all that kind of thing. And so it could be configuration errors, could be user errors, um, updates go wrong, anything like this. It could also be the software, the actual operating system on the router. There might be a bug in it, there could be issues in there. Um, that certain conditions cause the routing configuration to fail, um, or the router to even fail, so the router to crash. And that's a serious issue. The other thing that could go wrong is the hardware. Right? Hardware is never 100% perfect. It can be, get faulty. Especially these days, you know, routers have very high density memory, high speed memory, very state of the art. Um, integrated circuits, chips, um, circuit boards and so forth. You know, the multi-layer circuit boards, high speed specialist chips. So it's easier for things to go wrong. Don't listen to your vendors when they say their equipment is 100% reliable. Right? Equipment is never 100% reliable. It may be very close to 100%, but it's never exactly 100%. It's just a fact of life. So if you've got a single local router connecting to a single upstream provider, you can have issues with the router going wrong. Even if you get the most perfect router there is and the configuration never breaks and the software doesn't have a single bug, impossible, but if you want to believe that, you still have the issue with the WAN media. So the way that you connect your local network to your upstream ISP. If this is fiber, fiber can break. Okay. Um, example of a fiber break. Was that yesterday, day before? I don't know how many of you watch the sky or watch as, as well, our astronomers, but was it two days ago, Venus was going in front of the sun. It's the last time it's going to happen until 2117. And NASA was tracking it in many parts around the world, including Australia. But their Australia station was cut off because somebody was doing roadworks and dug up the fiber right at the time when Venus was going in front of the sun. So they don't have any pictures, or they've lost half an hour of pictures from, from Australia, right? Meet wide media, people can break the fiber. So don't believe your fiber is perfect. And I don't know, those of you who've got international connections will know all about that. Your fiber's going, what, the railways through Russia to Europe somewhere? Well, the Trans-Siberian Railway, I mean, a lot of it's built over, well, the type of ground is not very good, the fiber can break very often. Or the fiber going the other direction, maybe through China and so forth, and then into the Pacific Ocean, well, that can break, crossing land, going under the sea as well. And so the long-distance fiber breaks quite a lot, whether it's 
people stealing the fiber because they think it's copper. That happens a lot in many countries. South Asia, Africa, it happens a great deal. Um, trains falling off tracks. So fiber goes alongside the railways, train comes off, breaks the fiber, happens quite a bit. Um, ships anchors, breaking the fiber going under the sea. Earthquakes under the sea, volcanoes under the sea, earthquakes on land. People just digging up fiber. Road traffic accidents, breaking bridges, breaks fiber. All these things can happen, and that's just fiber. If you use microwave for long distance, well, microwave, the, the wavelength of microwave can be very similar to the wavelength of water droplets. So if there's a certain type of rain, it stops the microwave working. What can you do about that? Or if you're using wireless like 8211, well, a lot of that is unlicensed frequency. Somebody else starts up 8211, same frequency. Your wireless gets interfered with, stops working, packet loss, and so forth. And it's not just the physical failure, it could be the carrier as well. It could be the optical switches, the optical transmission system can break. And so those things are serious issues as well. And even if you get the most perfect wine media, you're then connecting to your upstream ISP. Do you think your upstream ISP runs a better network than you? Well, if you think that they do, they do, you're probably wrong. Right? Trusting a single upstream provider with all your internet access, probably not the best idea. They have the same issues as you, their routers, the configuration, the software, the hardware, and the network. And for us in Europe, connecting to the US, well, the US ISPs do the maintenance from 4 a.m. to 7 a.m., US time. East Coast US, five hours time difference to London. So 4 a.m., 7 a.m., East Coast US, 9 a.m. to 12 noon in Europe. And so we had our network shut down for several hours while the US did maintenance. And it was the busiest time of our day. So if you connect internationally to one ISP, they do the maintenance, you're off air until they come back. Not a good idea. So you want to have router independence, physical connect connectivity independence, and independence of your upstream service provider as well. You don't want to, you don't want to have a single point of failure in the network. Okay? So that's why we multi-home, to give ourselves redundancy, so we don't have any single point of failure. And of course, Anybody who's running anything that's business critical on the network demands continuous availability. When I was at Cisco, I, I would always say with this slide, well, you know, Cisco, biggest vendor in the world, every single router is sold through Cisco's website. Cisco website goes down, nobody can buy equipment. I suppose it's the same for us at APNIC. If our website goes down, nobody can do the one click for IPv6. So we can't sign up new members or give out V6 addresses. But we want to be around all the time. Right? We want everything to be available. Right? Well, you probably noticed earlier today, the DNS server for the hotel stopped working. And people were upset. Well, that's the same thing. You want, you want your network to be available all the time. Bits of it can't stop working, ever. So you need the redundancy for that. And so reliability is very, very important. And if you don't have redundancy, there's no way you can get reliability. Absolutely no way at all. And so you need redundancy. Don't be taken in by people who say, my equipment 100% reliable. I will give you two right processors and the router will never fail. Not true. It's much cheaper operationally to buy two routers half full than one router with everything redundant in it. The router vendors cannot make a router that's 100% redundant and will give failover without losing a single packet. It is physically not possible to do that. You cannot do that with TCP IP. There's no way of containing state 
duplicating state between two um, write processes on a router. You can come close to it, but you still have a break. And the break is still longer than ISIS takes to fail over between two routers. So that's one example. Right, so lack of redundancy means lack of reliability, means loss of revenue, angry customers, and probably the change the supplier. Supplier diversity, many businesses ask for supplier diversity as a matter of course. I mean, even though the upstream ISP may be perfect, they still say, right, we know you're perfect and all the rest, but we still want to connect to another ISP just in case the worst happens. So if you've got a customer who comes along and says, well, I want to multi-home, don't discourage them. I mean, they're looking after the quality of their connectivity. They may still, you, still have you as primary supplier, but at least when they multi-home, if something does go badly wrong in your network, they carry on with their business and they don't get upset with you. Right? So many business demand supplier diversity as a matter of course. So interconnection from two or more suppliers. So you have two or more upstream providers. Two or more diverse paths. Quite often I see people look at this, yep, they've got two upstream ISPs, but the connection to them is on the same fiber, to the same place, and then they connect there. Well, that gives you ISP redundancy, but it doesn't give you WAN redundancy. See, historically here in Mongolia, internet connection is through Russia and through China, which is okay, but you, know, you don't really have much choice. I mean, in other words, you go up into the sky, use a satellite. I mean, those have been the two main fiber paths. And so there's a very good reason why the transit ISPs here will use one ISP through going through the fiber through China, the other ISP through the Russian fiber. Because even if the China one breaks, the Russia one gives you backup and vice versa. So that's very important. But I've worked in some countries where there was only one fiber out of the country. Well, there have been many stories about this. When um, CMEWE 3 landed in Pakistan, all the ISPs cancelled the satellite internet. Because, oh, I've got fiber, it'll never break. And a year or so later, a big ship dragged its anchor through the fiber, cut the fiber, and the ISPs lost all their internet access because they canceled the satellite as well. So they did nothing until the fiber was fixed about three years later. And it almost started a war between Pakistan and India because the ship that dragged its anchor was an Indian cargo ship. Right, so these things are actually quite serious. So getting redundancy, diversity is very, very important. Uh, so, you know, we've had experiences in Europe like this. A lot of the fiber that goes from Europe to the US goes through the UK and out the southwest. The southwest corner of the UK has about eight or nine fibers, as last I counted, all going over to the US. So if you find that bit of coast, you see all the different landing stations. Not very good diversity, because if something happens there, they lose everything. Well, what about, well, two years ago, three years ago, two years ago, there was an earthquake between Philippines and Taiwan. So it was eight of the nine fibers that go from Asia up to Japan to the US were cut because of an undersea earthquake. It was about 60 kilometers long. But this big earthquake cut eight of the nine fibers. So all these ISPs who had diverse, or what they thought were diverse land paths, then discovered that the fibers all went very close together between Philippines and Taiwan. So you, you need to plan where your fiber is going. So now ISPs in Southeast Asia buy fiber going east and fiber going west. So if east breaks, west is the backup. If west breaks, east is the backup. At least here, you don't have much choice. You have to do that. You can only buy east or west. Um, so that's diverse wine paths. Look where, see where your fiber is going. 
two or more exit points to the network. That's very important as well. If you've got a big network, but only one pop connects to the outside world, if that pop breaks, you're gone. So what you tend to find ISPs doing, they have one international connection from one pop, another international connection from another pop. If you've only got one part of presence, then you've got one international connection from one router, one connection from the other router. Make sure the routers are in different equipment racks. They have different power supplies. And you make sure that the power from the routers, one comes from a UPS, the other one comes from the mains. Because UPSs break. Okay. Yes, the mains breaks a lot, but the UPS can break as well. So that's typically how ISPs power the routers. One from protected power, the other one from unprotected power. So if there's any problem with protected, then at least things will still work. The general rule is two of everything. Two of everything. Okay, if you've ever been in an aeroplane, you'll know that aeroplanes have two engines, or at least two engines. It's a good reason for that. Flying in a plane with one engine, if it stops working, things aren't very good. Okay, so commercial aircraft tend to have two engines. So, as I say, there's a very good reason for two of everything. You want to make sure that stuff still works if one breaks. So redundancy, diversity, two of everything is very, very important. So that's why I was saying earlier, don't buy one super redundant router which isn't redundant. Get two chassis. Chassis is very cheap. Even the biggest router, the chassis is a few thousand dollars. It's the route flow process of the line cars that are very, very expensive. So rather than getting redundant processes of one router, buy two chassis, put them side by side, one RP there, one RP here, some interfaces there, some there, ISIs between them, and the failover will be much faster than if you were using the redundant processors in them. And there won't be any breaks in connectivity either. Okay, so that's two of everything. Another reason, I mean it's not really a reason, but quite a few people say it is, is I suppose leverage. So playing one ISP off against another. See, if you just go and buy an internet connection, you get it for a price. But if you compare ISP prices, it's amazing how you can reduce the costs. And I've worked with many ISPs in many different countries. Some of them, they're just starting up. They phone up somebody who provides internet access and says, give me a price. They give a price and they pay it. Well, when you go shopping, do you just buy the first thing that you see? Of course not. You go to different shops comparing the prices. So another reason for multi-homing is to compare the prices, the service quality, service offerings, availability, and so forth between the different ISPs. And the nice thing, if you multi-home, connect to two different ISPs, you can see how good ISP A is versus ISP B. And if you decide to change ISP, you add a third one, and then you cancel either of the two that you want to cancel. So you're already running BGP, you're multi-hold, so adding another ISP is transparent to your customers. Because if you don't multi-hold and you want to change ISP, it means big data. So multi-homing actually makes you very, very easy to change your upstream ISP. I mean, there's more about that. I'm going to talk about the ISP network design tomorrow morning. I've got a design presentation I'll do. It's very important if you've got international links like this. This is why I drew this picture earlier. It'll come back tomorrow. Like you're here, you've got the redundancy, but changing that, your transit ISP, if you have a router there, is very, very easy. Because if you don't like your transit, you sign up another one, plug them in, and then disconnect this one. Very, very easy to change your upstream provider. Whereas, if you don't do that, you just plug it to somebody overseas, changing them becomes a major pain. It can take several days of downtime 
before you can do that. Summary of all this, multi-homing is easy to demand as a requirement of any operation. So your, your CTO or CEO or company board can say, need to multi-home, do it. Well, that's fine, but what does it actually mean? What do you have to do? What changes do you need to make to the network? And so really the goal of all this is to show you how to do multi-homing as cheaply and simply as possible. Right? I've got lots of examples here. None of them are complicated. They're all very simple examples. They're taken from real life working networks. And I'm just sharing them with you so that you can go and do multi-homing as well. It's not complicated at all. Now, multi-homing means that you've got more than one link external to the local network. <coughs> right, so that's two or more links to the same ISP. Yes, this is multi-homing. And if you're connecting to your upstream in two places, you're multi-homed. You've got two or more links to different ISPs, well, that's the more traditional multi-homed. And I'm going to work through configuration examples for, us, for all the relevant scenarios here. I'm using two external facing routers. If you only have got one router, you don't have router redundancy. It's generally a good idea to have router redundancy. If one router breaks, then at least you can move over to the other one very, very quickly, or the network will let you do that. So we've got two external facing routers. The excuse that routers are expensive is not really an excuse. The only extra purchase you need is a route processor, if you're using the big line card ones. So compared with the operational difficulty it will give you, two routers are cheap. Okay, so two external facing routers. Scenarios I describe, well the configurations are by and large on the customer. Upstream ISPs do not like doing special configuration for customers. They give you either a full BGP table or default route and nothing else. So that's really what we're going to concentrate on. We're going to concentrate on configuration that goes to the end site. And customers are quite happy if they've got the configuration on their router because they can go and change things. They don't have to get the ISPs, operations people involved in changing multi-homing configuration. Now to multi-home we need an AS number. Uh, I put, put up this slide before of course. Um, this is the whole range. But anyway, AS numbers, 32-bit range, as I said before. Multi-homing to the same AS, we use a private AS number. Multi-homing to different ASs, we use one of the public numbers. So these are the autonomous systems. Get them from the registries. Allocations up to 61,400 have been made. About 41,000 visible on the internet about 2,832-bit AS numbers visible on the network as well. So as I was saying, private ASs are used for ISPs multi-homing to the same upstream. So you're connecting to the same upstream provider. So quite often, an ISP is not going to have one multi-home customer. They're going to have lots. And RFC 2270 describes how to do this. Also, you find that more and more corporate networks are designing the networks to be like ISP backbones. So they're using OSPF, ISIS, and IBGP. Some are even going further. This may not impact you, but some multinationals are using BGP, where they give regional offices their own AS, and the regional offices peer with headquarters to connect to the rest of the internet. So that's another typical use of a private AS. BGP Confederation I mentioned yesterday, so use private ASs inside those as well. Private ASs need to be removed from any BGP announcement to the internet. So you put that in your configuration template. Cisco IOS configuration looks like this. Neighbor, remove private AS. So same as private address space, private ASNs, are intended for internal use. They should not appear on the internet at all. Okay, so if you've got things like 
maybe a lab network. You can run BGP there, just put it in a private AS, then it doesn't have to be part of your backbone. If you've got customers multi homing onto your network, use a private AS. You won't get a public AS number from APNIC if you have a customer who's multi homing onto your backbone. It's only when they connect to different ISPs, different networks, will they get a public AS number. All right, so that's a private AS number. So just add this into your eBGP template. Neighbor, remove private AS. Now, I didn't mention it earlier in the best practices, but maybe I should add it in. Don't know. But anyway, it's here, multi-homing. Don't forget to do this on the eBGP sessions. <coughs> Transit and peering are the default. We've seen this already. Transit means carrying traffic across a network for a fee. Transit providers charge you money to get access to the rest of the internet. Whereas peering, ISPs interconnect the networks to avoid having to pay the transit providers for traffic, to improve quality of service, to improve round trip times in the local area. And peering is very, very important especially between competing ISPs. But very, very important is how the internet exists. Right? So peering is very important, done for no fee. Some people call it settlement-free peering. Right? So I say peering is very important. Well, again, we'll talk about it again tomorrow, the importance of peering. Default, where we send traffic when there's no explicit match in the BGP routing table. So we know about the default routers. During the policy, we're going to use prefix lists for filtering prefixes. We're not going to use access lists for filtering prefixes, so not packet filters. The three basic principles, I'm going to keep all this nice and easy. Prefix list to filter prefixes. Filter list to filter ASNs. And we'll use route maps to apply policy. So all the examples I have <coughs> will be doing these three things. Now, we can use route maps for filtering, but that, I consider that a bit more advanced. We'll keep it nice and simple first. Tomorrow, we'll talk about route maps, and you'll see how they're used for filtering. Okay, so we'll use prefix lists, filter lists, and route maps to apply our policy. The tools we have, reminder of the BGP presentation on Monday afternoon. Local preference is used for outbound traffic flows. So if you want to steer traffic out of your network, you use local pref and you tag local pref on inbound BGP announcements. So remember, routing information flows this way, packets flow that way. So if we want to influence outbound traffic flows, we need to set local preference. MED is for inbound traffic flows, but only if you're connecting to the same AS. Right, so you've got two or more links to the same AS, we use MED. Thirdly, <coughs> AS path prepend, inbound traffic flows, but this time this is for internet scope. If you use the AS path prepend, you're changing the AS path length, and the whole internet will see this change. Right, so MED is used only if you're connecting two or more links to the same provider. AS path prepared if you're connecting to different providers. It lets you do inbound traffic engineering. BGP communities, if there's time tomorrow, I'll take a look at BGP communities and how you can use them. As I said the other day, ISPs I touch, I say, horrible, we're going to use BGP communities. We get rid of Prefix filters, AS path filters, we use communities instead. It's much, much easier in the long run to use communities. Right, originating prefixes. The assumptions are that we're going to announce our assigned address block out to the internet. Remember the aggregation talk during the BGP best practices. Well, we always announce our aggregates. So the address block or blocks we get from the registry, we always announce. 
This gives us redundancy on multiple links. If one link fails, because we announce the address block on the other, we have a backup. We may also announce sub-prefixes. Right? The sub-prefixes we use for traffic engineering. Remember, a sub-prefix will always win over the covering aggregate. That was the introduction to routing presentation I did first thing on Monday morning. Sub-prefixes will always win over the covering aggregate. So that means traffic for that sub-prefix will come in this link. So we announce sub-prefixes for our traffic engineering. That's how we do it. That's how multi domain will work. Current minimum allocation, 20 to 24, depending on the registry. Many ISPs filter the registry blocks on the boundaries, so the minimum allocation of the registries are made. Some ISPs even filter the rest of address space according to the IANA assignments. So historical address space handed out before the registries existed were usually slash 8, slash 16, so ISPs will filter on those boundaries. So the registries publish the minimum allocations here, and several ISPs will use this to filter their BGP table. They don't want 412,000 prefixes. If they filter it the same way as I did in my writing report, we could take the internet down to about 180,000 prefixes. Why carry 260,000 prefixes of junk, things that are not needed? So we'll just jump over this. The only thing I'll point out, if you want to filter prefixes, use the Team Cymru BGP feed. Right, there's the URL there. It shows you how to configure your network to use the Team Cymru route server for filtering programs. So how do we multi-home? Well, a transit provider is another autonomous system which is used to provide the local network with access to the rest of the internet. So your transit provider could maybe just give you local transit. They might give you regional transit, but it's more common just for them to give you everything, the whole internet. Transit providers need to be chosen wisely. If you've only got one, you've got no redundancy. And you want redundancy. If you've got too many, you cannot multi-hole. It's just too difficult to do the load balancing. I've had many requests from people saying, oh, please help me multi-home, I've got 16 upstream ISPs. Sorry, can't. Too difficult. Get rid of some of the upstreams, take it down to two or three. That is the maximum you want to do. So again, if you're in the transit business here, you've got your international connections, don't get too many ISPs. Two, maximum three, the rest you want to get by peering, much easier to do. Right, so the recommendation here, at least two, no more than three transit providers. As soon as you get more than that, it becomes really hard to do traffic engineering. Right, it becomes really hard. I'll show you tomorrow why it is really hard. I've got a lovely example, upstream ISP, <coughs> sorry, an ISP with three upstreams. And I'll show you the configuration you need. It's not too complicated, but you can see that if I add a fourth upstream, it's going to get really complicated. Okay, so make sure two upstream providers, no more than three. So the common mistakes, ISP sign up with lots of transit providers, you end up with lots of small circuits. Small circuits cost a lot more per megabit per second than big ones. Right, a two and a half gigabit per second circuit in London costs about, what, three dollars a megabit in London? If you buy a 155 megabit in London, you're looking at about 60 or 70 dollars a megabit. So why would you buy a 155? It doesn't make any sense. You buy two and a half instead. It's that type of thing. Transit rates per megabit reduce with increasing bandwidth cost purchase. So if you buy two and a half gig, rather than lots of little 155, you save yourself a huge amount of money. That's why you find that ISPs tend to buy as big a connection as they can. It becomes very hard to implement reliable traffic engineering that doesn't need daily fine tuning. 
lots of little providers. And all these little circuits may fill up. How do you do load balancing here? You're forever sitting there trying to adjust the load balancing. You'll never get it perfect. You'll be doing it every day, morning, noon, night. Somebody phones up complaining, you make an adjustment. Somebody else complains, you adjust it again. Too hard. The other thing that people make a mistake with is no diversity. They sign up to the upstream ISPs, as I said earlier, but they're all over the same bit, the transmission link. It's the same transmission. Make sure it's different transmission. It could be this, people do things over the same satellite. This is common in the Pacific Islands. The Pacific Ocean, there are lots of nations there. There are several satellites, but it seems that all the ISPs sign up with just one satellite. And a few years ago, one of those satellites fell out of the sky, and many nations lost all their internet, all their telecommunications, everything, because the satellite fell out of the sky. And they had to wait several months before they could actually get another connection. So don't make that mistake. If you're looking for diversity, make sure the transmission is completely independent end to end. The other mistake people make is chosen trans providers have poor onward transit and peering. Now you can look, oh yeah, you've got nice diverse trans providers, but you don't look further up. You don't look what happens beyond there. Now, a peer is another autonomous system in which you, the local network has agreed to exchange locally sourced rights and traffic. So a private peer, private link between two providers for the purpose of connecting. So private peering is very common. Many, many ISPs will have a private connection between each other. Generally, the bigger providers will do this. Public peering, internet exchange point. So an ethernet switch for ISPs bring a router, plug it in, set up BGP with each other, and they freely decide who they interconnect with. The recommendation is to peer as much as possible. I was telling you the other day, ISPs I work with who go to some of the major peering points get 60 or 70% of the traffic by peering at a public exchange point. 60 or 70% of the traffic they get by peering for free. They don't have to pay anything apart from the circuit to get there. And the circuit is usually much, much cheaper than paying for transit. So that's very important. Any place where there's no exchange point really has very, very poor internet experience. So the internet exchange points are really very, very important part of the internet ecosystem. Now, private peering is important too, but Running lots of different circuits and different ISPs doesn't scale. It starts costing money. So then it makes more sense to go to an internet exchange point. It's just an ethernet switch. You plug your router in there, set up BGP with other ISPs, and you peer. Common mistakes. Trans mistaking a trans provider exchange business for no cost public peering point. There's some ISPs, especially in the Middle East, who set up the transit business and call it an exchange. Well, it's probably exchanging packets, but that's all it's doing. It's not an internet exchange point. And it's certainly not for free. An internet exchange point is free. You don't pay for it. All you pay is to plug into the switch. That's it. As soon as you start paying for packets, it stops being an exchange point, and it becomes a transit provider. And as a transit provider, it's the same as any other transit provider as well. Not working hard to get as much peering as possible. I mean, it's very important to join the, if, you, if you're connecting internationally, it's very, very important to go to exchange points. Right? These will give you, these will give you 50, 60, 70% of your traffic depending on where you go. So it's very, very important. If you've got international connection now, make sure you turn up at an exchange point because it will save you a huge amount of money. 70%, 60, 70% depending on where you go. That's a typical mistake. And I see this again in the Middle East quite a bit. ISPs are in the same data center, but they pay for transit. And when I say something about it, they say, 
Ah, oh, Philip, you don't understand. You know, we've got plenty of money. Plenty of money is not the point. Um, getting access to peering means that you don't have to pay for transit. You can make the quality of service experience for the network a lot better than you'd ever get through transit. Another common mistake, ignoring or avoiding competitors because of competition. But when we set up the links in London, this was not done by the salespeople of the ISPs. This was done by the technical people, the chief technology officer of these ISPs interconnected the networks because they knew that sending traffic from London to San Francisco back to London just to send email between two competing ISPs made no sense at all. So even though you know, the five of us or four ISPs were competing because the others were the academics, because the four ISPs were competing, we still interconnected. And that changed the UK from being an internet backwater to being the place where anybody goes in Europe now. It's probably one of the biggest internet places in Europe because the exchange point is there. All the other ISPs come in, everybody peers with each other, even the ISPs who are competitors. So not peering with a competitor is a really bad thing. It just harms you. What else? Okay, right, here we go. So the scenarios I'm going to look at, stub network, the multi-home stub network, a multi-home network, and then how we do multiple sessions to another AS. So if you've got this situation, you've got the upstream ISP, who's got a customer, who's got two links. We've got the two links, but we don't have router redundancy at either end. So this is just the same as putting two parallel circuits, <coughs> two static connections. You don't need BGP here. You can run BGP if you want. It'll work perfectly fine. But all you need to do is just point two static default routes from here to the upstream. And the upstream just needs to point two routes to this network from their router. Your static routing will work fine, whether it's one, two, three, four, five, or whatever connections. Don't need BGP for it. Load balancing, the router will just do per destination load balancing as normal. Whereas this situation is different. Right, so this network here is connecting to two different routers in the upstream network. Two different places being connected to. Here, yes, you can use static routes, but it's not going to work very well. You have, you have this situation called floating statics. Failover will be very slow, 30 seconds or longer. Depends on the router refresh time. So here you want to use BGP. Right? We use BGP, private AS, notice, private AS, BGP to talk to AS100. As far as the world is concerned, it looks like a static connection but it's still multi-homing um, within the customer and the upstream provider. So we're using a private AS. This situation is different again. Here we need to use a public AS number. This AS is multi-homed between 200 and 300. It needs to do load balancing there. So this ends up being quite a complicated situation. We need to be able to do traffic engineering, select who's going to be primary, who's going to be backup, and so forth. So how do we do multiple sessions to an ISP? Well, there's several options. Here's the first one. We can use eBGP multi -hop. Now, eBGP, remember I was saying, runs on a point-to-point -point link between you and your neighboring AS. It runs on the point-to-point -point link. Because eBGP assumes that you're directly connected. It's got no other way of finding the remote router. But what happens in something like this? Well, here we could run three BGP sessions. We could do that. But then we're running three BGP sessions. So there's a neat trick. It's a bit of a hack. There's a neat trick you can do. And what you can do instead is run eBGP between the loopbacks of these routers. 
And all you do is set up a static route to the remote loopback, pointing to the physical interface of your router. So you've got three static routes, and the router will then load balance over these three links. We need to tell eBGP that the neighboring router is not directly connected. eBGP, according to the specification, neighbor has to be directly connected. But this breaks the rules by saying, no, the neighbor is actually two hops away. Right, the loop back here is not connected to the loop back there. We've got to go over another link to get to this loop back, so it becomes two hops. Right, and that way we can run EBGP between the loopbacks. A common mistake that people make is to point this to a remote IP address. This has to be the physical interface. As soon as you put an IP address in here, this can happen. This can happen. If the direct link goes down, the eBGP session can run via another path. And that's a big problem. Because you've got no way of telling, this may be the big link, this could be the backup. The big link fails, the BGP session still runs, you have no idea that it's actually gone down. All you see is congestion on the network. So this is why eBGP multi-hop is actually quite dangerous. Only use it if there's no alternative. So only use it in a situation like this, and you point static route to the remote loopback to the physical interface on the router. So this, of course, means if your connection to the other AS is Ethernet, you can't do this. And you've got to use an IP address. And if you use an IP address, this is what can go wrong. And so using eBGP multi-hop on Ethernet point-to-point -point link, not recommended at all. Very, very risky. Operationally, very, very risky. So try and avoid using eBGP multi-hop unless it's necessary. You want to load share across multiple links. In fact, you find most ISPs who understand BGP will not support it. So you'll generally run BGP multi-hop, but don't support it as a standard offering. That's the sort of thing, the sort of feedback you see from some of the major ISPs. Right, you can also run multiple BGP sessions. Right? We can do three neighbors, like that. And there's another feature called multipath. We can run multipath. Okay, so now, back to the load sharing one. This is the load sharing with different ISPs. So the diagram, if you forward to the diagram, where you see AS100, AS120, AS130, and we're going to do load balancing slightly different way. So what we're going to do here, we're going to change two things. So the first thing we do is we send the slash 19 out, so we send the aggregate out each link. That's all fine. But on the second link from router B to router D, we're also going to leak a slash 20. Right? We're going to leak the slash 20 out. This means that all traffic for that slash 20 will come in this link. It will come in the D to B link. That's what happens. If we announce one sub-prefix, all the traffic for that slash 20 will come in there. And we also announce the aggregate with an AS path prepend. Maybe one, two, three. So there are now two things we can adjust. We can adjust the size of the AS path prepend, and we can adjust the size of the sub-prefix to determine the amount of traffic that comes on this connection. The smaller the, the sub-prefix, the less traffic here. The longer the prepend, the less the traffic is here. Okay? So that's, we've now got two things we can change. Right? We can adjust the sub-prefix size. So if a slash 20 attracts too much traffic, we can make the AS path prepend longer. Okay, so those sort of things. So that's the sort of thing we can adjust. So this is a much more powerful um, example. So that's an A configuration, again, just standard default in, aggregate out, no problems. The router B configuration is where it gets interesting. 
we set, get the default in, but outbound we send the 19 and 1 slash 20. And we can vary the size as we want. With the aggregate, here I've done a two times prepend. We can make it one times, might get us some more traffic. We can make it three times, it will reduce the traffic. Right? So you see how this will work. So we can set the sub prefix size, not enough traffic, reduce the prepend. Too much traffic, increase the prepend. So it's a bit like a, I don't know, like a mixing thing for your sound, for your music. You've got two things that you can adjust, two sliders you can adjust to vary the load balancing. So most people who are multi homing to different ISPs are using exactly this configuration. This is all there is. If you want to do inbound load balancing for traffic, this slide is what you do. Right? That's all you vary. You vary the sub-prefix size you're leaking, and the AS path prepend that you're applying. There are no other tricks or techniques. There's nothing else you can do. Right? There are no other features in BGP to do inbound load balance. This is it. This is the summary of the whole piece. If you know how to configure this, and here's your example, you will do inbound load balancing. So this example is more commonplace. Shows how ISPs and N-Sites subdivide address space frugally as well as using the ASPath prepend concept to optimize load sharing. Notice the 19 is always a max. So summary of all this, previous examples dealt with a very simple case, load balancing inbound traffic flow. What we're going to do, what we're going to do tomorrow is look at outbound load balancing. And we've done inbound, we've decided it's pretty easy. Right? I've just shown you what has to be done. Now, two slides ago, showed you the configuration you need. So far now, outbound traffic has only been nearest exit. We need to do better than nearest exit, especially if you've got connectivity that goes halfway around the world to different continents. Okay, so that's going to be tomorrow. This is the end of what we're going to do today. Um, so tomorrow, the second multi-homing presentation we're going to look at ISP design, we're going to look at the V6 case study, and we're going to finish this lab module as well. Okay? Any questions about what we've done today? If not, enjoy your evening. We'll see you tomorrow, 9 o'clock, last day. If you have any questions or any things you would like us to go over, at the end of the day, please let us know tomorrow. Hopefully there will be time to do that. Okay. All right. See you tomorrow. See you.